Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a jam-packed show for you today. We have got Peggy Doty here, energy environmental educator with U of I Extension. But before we get to Peggy, we have to introduce our co-hosts that are with us this week here and every week is Katie Parker, local foods educator in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hey, Chris. How's it going? It's going just just fine. Um, yeah. No comment. <laughs> How are you, Katie? <laughs> oh, good as always. Yeah. Have you uh, turned your Christmas music on yet? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. So we just we tell our um, little smart speaker, we tell it because it's the computer because everything in my house is Star Trek or Star Wars. Um, we say we take computer, play Christmas music. And so it just lavishes us all evening with Christmas music. How about you? Are you listening to some Christmas tunes? I turned it on today. I figured uh, today's December 15th. We're 10 days out. It's time to get started. That's right. That's right. And then you <laughs> stop on December 26th, right? Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville. No. You stop, you stop then. <laughs> December 26th is the worst day of the year. That's when the <sighs> Christmas music stops. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Oh, Ken is the person who listens to Christmas music all year long. Um, and you can see he's snowed in here, folks. So we are broadcasting podcasts. So you can listen to us um, on the podcast platform of your choosing, or you can watch us on YouTube. And links to all of those things will be down below us in the description. But Ken and Katie, have you, you have yards, right? I've, I know Ken's got a yard. Katie's got a yard. Have you ever had an animal cross into your yard these days? Yes. We actually, yeah, ah. uh, we recently got a motion detection um, security lights on our garage. And every day there's a cat that walks across our driveway, goes back to my container garden and leaves me a gift every single day, <laughs> like Aww. clockwork. And so I have to go out there and dig it out. It's like a giant cat litter box for it, I guess. Um, yeah, so... I'm Something to look forward to each day. <laughs> a darn cat. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Ken, do you have cats that come to your yard and uh, use it as a litter box? Um, we have in the past. But now that we have a dog, <clears throat> I'm not sure they come around as often. The dog leaves presents in the yards, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, shoot, Katie. Well, you know, we have a great guest today who, I don't know, she might have some ideas about outdoor cats. Uh, they might not be the ideas some cat lovers want to hear, but uh, we have Peggy Doty on the podcast, Energy Environment Educator. Peggy, welcome to the show. Thanks, everybody. It's good to be here again. Well, we are happy to have you, and you're going to be here talking to us about wildlife in the backyards. And, you know, kind of as we kick off the show, we, we've heard about some of, we're, we're thinking like wildlife, wildlife, but we have a little bit of domestic wildlife that might also be traversing through our yards. Peggy, do you have to deal with uh, kind of the domestic, say the, the feline type or the, the, the canine type of wildlife? Illinois doesn't have any wild dogs, so. Yeah, no, I think that pet owners, yeah, um, we have a few, but you don't, you don't often know it. The hard part is if you get a, a visiting cat um, one, you know, don't, if you have outdoor cats of your own, pick up the food. We don't want extra non-domestic guests eating lots of cat food. Um, but the, the thing is, if you have indoor cats, I have indoor cats. Um, and I used to have indoor and outdoor cats. But if an outdoor cat starts, a male starts spraying in your yard, marking it as his, because he's a feral cat or just a cat that's allowed in and out, your cat, if it's near a window or a, a spot in your house where that cat can get any scent of it, your cat could start doing those poor behaviors. And you might think they're just doing something bad, but really they're trying to protect your home. It's not the way we see protection. Um, we shouldn't be piddling around the house to protect it, but they don't know. <laughs> so I guess in my, as you brought that up, I'm like, oh, you know, outdoor cats can cause problems for cat owners because we don't realize that they're picking up a bad, doing a bad behavior based on some, we don't see it. So a, a camera might tell you, you know, oh, that's what's going on. So now if somebody else is marking outside, so somebody says, okay, you can, I got to guard this wall and they're going to do that poor behavior on the inside. Mm. I used to be a vet technician. So <laughs> there's all kinds of that stuff that goes along with any kind of animal issue, right? Well, 
you've inspired my next business uh, opportunity. So we're going to create a company that advertises people to mark their territory as a way to keep their homes <laughs> protected from burglary. <laughs> who, who needs a camera? Just I mean, it, if drink if lots of water and tea and go outside. If it smells really bad, <laughs> who wants to break in? You know, so. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or yes. the people that see you doing that are like, we're not going in that house. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> There's <laughs> nothing worth stealing from there. <laughs> Something's going on. <laughs> well, Peggy, last time you were on the show, Bruno the Bear was making headlines. He was in the news, but then he he was trying. They they got him. They tranked him, and then they hauled him somewhere. I have not heard anything since then. Do you know what's happened? And to Bruno? I honestly have not either, and that drives me crazy. And I've, I've looked a little, but we're so busy with extension, you know, all the work we do. It's like, there's tiny windows. It's like, where's Bruno? I think it's kind of like, where's Waldo? We need to just start our own. Where's Bruno? Um, you know, and, and in all honesty, my guess is that, you know, when you deal with people and wildlife, you're dealing with a lot of wildlife values, right? People who have these deep attachments um, and want to preserve them all. And that's their heart speaking. And then there's people who realize we need to deal with wildlife in a way that keeps people safe or the animals safe, you know, and it's just best to go, he was such a wonderful bear to watch and now he's happy and fine. Chances are he's in some sort of non, like a private um, mm. wildlife caregiving situation where he won't be, thank goodness, put on display and become just like another zoo animal and will live his life out with, you know, there's a few of those around the country. I know there's one in um, Wisconsin as well. Uh, might've been where he was, who knows? And maybe he got out, but they try to just care for them and give them quality of life um, if they've picked up poor behaviors. Because really, if you get an animal that's a predator and a size like that, a poor behavior can very quickly, you know, mm -hmm. lead to some really bad situations. I don't know if you've been watching, there's a, a specific grizzly bear that everybody knows. Um, uh, now I can't remember, she's 319 or 399. They have numbers out in Yellowstone. She has she has gone out of her usual territory for the first time and she's going to beehives and getting honey and doing these things. Then everybody's terrified for her because if she makes an inappropriate move, she's going to create a path for her own destruction for the safety of people. And then there's people who's like, well, that's too bad for them. Right. We have all these values to weigh, but when what they haven't said, that's making me crazy. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just another person in the field. She has four cubs to feed for the first time. Oh. She's 24 years old as a single mom. I'm going to take you out. If you have a loaf of bread and I don't have anything to enough energy to feed these growing children, right? Mm -hmm. There's, we would have survival needs too. Um, so that's more of an answer than you wanted, but we have to remember how many sides to every one of these situations there are in the human value regime. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I, and I remember hearing uh, when you talked about large predators to our local master naturalists, that there is just so much, there, there's sensitivity on both sides of that spectrum. So you have to be, you, you just have to be aware of that and, and know that people have been hurt and people have enjoyed the, these wild animals. So you just have mm -hmm. to know that. Yeah. 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 So who knows where Bruno is? I'm just going to believe he's kicked back. Nobody's staring at him and he's living <laughs> the life, you know, staying chubby and getting what he wants to eat when he wants it. That's doing what a bear does. Yeah. Yeah. Like Yogi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's doing the Yogi. <laughs> So Peggy, with more of us working from home, we're seeing a lot more wildlife that would often go unnoticed. Are you getting more calls on wildlife questions or hearing more about wildlife damage? Um, I have. This year, the what we call the expert assistance. Um, I think when I did a report, it's not even to the end of the year, there were like 42 different situations I had listed. Everything from bats to you know, a coyote walk through my yard. And that was actually from a co-extension worker. A coyote went through my yard two, like two days in a row. I'm like, they do it every day. You're just usually not home, you know? And it's, and I've been really happy to see they're not people that are screaming in paranoia. They're just like letting me know. And mm -hmm. they just want to know more, which tells me they want to have some education on it or they just are excited to share it. Um, so that's been nice. I had one from Chicago, um, well, somebody was uh, feeding squirrels and the other tenant didn't care for that because when she opened the doors, the squirrels would stand and look at her. And she wanted me to assure her that the squirrel probably wasn't going to launch onto her and this and that. And we had a long 45 minute conversation about how we relate to wildlife once we 
give them something, you know, once we make a relationship with them. So when it comes to animals causing destruction, what, what kind of is the, the animal that, that kind of causes the most havoc, causes the most destruction? And, and what are some things we can do to kind of minimize that? You know, it's to start off any conversation where wildlife is doing something, how we look at it we look, to us, they're doing this to me. Um, as you know, I'm a naturalist, not a gardener. Um, I have to look to, to Wendy for my gardener view. I don't have a gardener view. I have a create a habitat and see who comes. And if I'd have the money to replace it, I do, but I don't get too wound up. And I, because I don't have that perspective of the gardener who is good at what they do. <laughs> I look at it as an opportunity to make it better. Maybe they'll change it. Um, so it's always tops the mark are deer because they're huge and they, rabbits are second. They're tiny and they can prune things and nip it off pretty well but deer just can gobble, right? The size of the animal. I always say what takes a chickadee all day at my feeders at the natural resource education center where I work, what takes a chickadee all day takes a deer one lick, mm -hmm. you know, to get that many seeds in its mouth. Um, so we, everything animals are to us where they've urbanized or they've become comfortable. We've created that, right? We're planting food, and it comes down to a bigger, a bigger topic of, div of diversity. Like if you set a table and you think you get to pick who sits at it, that's tricky business, right? I have a lot of calls about how do I stop squirrels from eating bird seed? Don't feed the birds. <laughs> I mean, it's, the, I mean, I hate to be that way, but you can't feed only what you want. I have, you know, I think I said this last time, my grandmother loved butterflies, but couldn't stand a caterpillar. Okay, so that was like, you can't have one without the other. So um, destruction wise are deer and you can go all day and plant as many. I love that people are willing to plant what we call deer resistant plants. I'm not real uh, aware of all of them because if you get the whole neighborhood to plant deer resistant plants and the deer live there, they're gonna be like, well, I guess this is what we get. And they're gonna start eating deer resistant plants because they're not poisonous, they're not venomous, they're not prickly, they just are less tasty. So if you have, you know, you have a bunch of food on your plate, I always eat the stuff I like best and go, oh, okay, gobble, gobble, let's get that gone, right? So it's the same thing. Um, fencing for rabbits is the only way you're going to stop the bunnies. Um, and we, you know, you can fence really high, but if you get a big blizzardy snow, they're going to take the top mm -hmm. off, right? And hopefully they prune it nicely, right? And then you'll be thicker the next year. Um, but Deer are, our population of deer are ex is so extensive. Um, once you get them, um, you're going to tackle, you're going to be tackling them. And we love our homes. You know, the homes, I love looking at the homes that are in those outer subdivisions with acreage and room and deep front lawns. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's a forest with houses in it. Right. <laughs> so it's a deer forest and you've put your home there and whatever you put out there is, you know, it's an opportunity to have contact. I mean, that's, I, I would say we have a lot of hostas and we have deer and I ate some hostas in the spring because they are lettuce. humans. We can eat them. They taste just like lettuce. They, they're good. You know, you put a little ranch or you put a little Italian, you know, if, if you like that kind of stuff that tastes just like you're eating a salad. So a little slug here and there to slip it down quicker. That's just some protein. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> a little escargot. Yeah. But I mean, it's no wonder why they eat some of these plants because some of them are delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm wondering, Peggy, also, you mentioned deer and rabbits. Mm -hmm. I get so many calls usually in the spring about voles with a V. Now people call and they say, ah, my yard has all of these runways in them or my trees they my little trees they've been nibbled around the base you know what in the world happened here so the voles with a v what can we do about voles with a v during the winter months yeah Whew. well you know right now a matter of fact i just went outside today i'm like i should know something about my garden and wildlife before this podcast <laughs> and i have an intense amount of vole trails now in my front garden i just spent you know 137 dollars on plants i'm trying to go as native as i can to you know walk the walk there's not a single um oh well there might be one non-native in the front and I'm going to go around the corner and I'm looking at all these vole trails. I'm like, I wonder what they're eating because they didn't go deeper. They're in the mulch. Mm -hmm. When we get snow cover, 
this isn't going to, this isn't helpful, but when we get snow cover, these are one of those subnivian animals. So sub being under niv being snow. And if they're a Nivian, they're a living thing under the snow. <laughs> so now they have cover and they breed many months of the year, right? So they're breeding under the snow. If it's too deep, the owls and hawks can't see them. That's a really big predator. Um, when the snow is shallow, they can see them. It's like whack-a-mole. They can pick them right out. Um, they can see the little dark. I feed birds. Um, and you could see when it's a low snow, you can watch the dark shadows coming in from the yard and going out. Mm-hmm. You can watch them. Mm-hmm. And I, and so that's for the hawks and the owls. <laughs> but it's, again, if you, right before winter, it's not going to be attractive. You could attempt they aren't really big tunnelers right as far as underground they tunnel a trough and just under the leaf litter or under the snow they're not digging down like a chipmunk Mm -hmm. so they'll dig down and top the get the top roots a little bit because they're digging that shallow you might lay around there like a skirt i'm guessing of a finer softer wire and then leave the things you're not as you don't care about they have to have something to eat the other thing to think about that i've i've read it's been a long time i think it was So a male and female will stay together. They're monogamous and have a nest under a log or under some protection. Get rid of the protection, ditch the cute rocks, ditch the logs. If you don't want to create the place they want to live, right. They have to have a a place to build for winter. They might be on top of the grass and have a, you know, a shredded grass nest in the summer, but in the winter, they got to find cover for the non snow time. And they go out from that nest, the pair and the male will run other males off. So, and that's like only a quarter acre. You may only have one pair. It's not thousands. It just looks like it when they trail and go out to eat. So if you could find a soft wire, if you have really precious cultivar, roses, all those things that you love and just put these skirts on them for the winter that, that, you know, kind of maybe fan out. I'm trying to think of what that, like an upside down funnel. Yeah. It might slow down. They're not going to be jumping up to get the top stuff. So you could do that and make it a, a full circle a little deeper and maybe a finer wire for rabbits and voles if you have both. But the vole population looks intense, but it's because they're breeding so often, it's all the youngsters scattering. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have your, um, your male and your female hanging out together. Um, it doesn't make it better, but it helps us understand there's not a hundred in one place. It's the kids and they're gonna go off and start breeding. You're just giving them to the neighbors. Their lifespan's really short too. Um, depending on the vole, it can be a month to less than a year. You know, they're just not a longevity animal. So this year's voles aren't your last year's voles. You can't train them, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, no, you know, go eat those plants. You know, they do love grass. In the winter, they're going to go for hard bark and roots because they don't have options. Um, I'd be the idiot gardener that would be the naturalist gardener and I'd go you know I have alfalfa for the tortoise out at the nature center or some sweet grass I might just grab some and see if I can't plant them a place you know just a pile mm-hmm. for them to eat and get them out of my, my native bed I don't have any of them wrapped but the natives are mostly roots and they're pretty deep right so if we yeah. plant more natives they have a chance of surviving that chewing because there's more roots deeper than some of our surface roots that's a lot sorry that's right. I, I knew someone and she was a naturalist also, and she didn't mind snakes. And so she would put pieces of tin out in her yard to encourage snakes to go under there because the tin warms up in the sun. And, and snakes are, they're not active in the winter, winter months, but they're, I have found snakes out in the yard in like late winter when it's still mm-hmm. cool out. Mm-hmm. So they start to wake up and they're hungry. And so she's like, you know, I have not had an issue with rodents ever since I started putting these pieces of tens out. It's like, I lift it up. There's a black snake, but you know, that's so natural predation could be, you know, that, as you mentioned with hawks and owls, that's a great. Yeah. And you, you know. can build a hibernaculum. I've got one designed that I got to have the rocks and two buckets right in view out my window. <laughs> um, they're bigger rocks. So what you do is you dig a, you dig a hole and then you fill the hole plus above it with rock. And that warmth and all those crevices give snakes a place to get down in. You can make one the size of a house mm-hmm. or you can make small ones. Um, garter snakes have been known to come out in January, sit in the sun. They're not going to eat mice. They're going to eat slugs and you know worms. And at that time of year, they're not going to eat anything. They're just going to heat their body back up. Um, so yes, snakes are a very contentious thing to talk about. 
But if you are, you definitely can reduce. And I just ask that people definitely don't put poison, um, if at all possible, not to poison rodents because then you're poisoning the food chain and then you're gonna lose. If you love hawks and you poison a mouse, you're very likely could kill that, kill that hawk through poisoning the rodent. Yeah. Um, even in your house, because if they're going in and out of your house, they're going to take that with them and then potentially die or an omnivore, uh, a, a possum. I forget, not everybody loves possums, but possums are harmless, um, but they'll come to you. I have one that comes to my feeder now again, finally, mm -hmm. um, and I have a protective runway for him because I have dogs. And so it's a long board. So he can go behind there and wait out the dogs. And the big dog, I trained him. I said, no possum, you get a snack. And he now goes out and whenever the possum's not there, he just hangs his head like, dang it. Because he doesn't get it. If there's no possum, he doesn't get a snack. But if he goes out and there's a possum and he looks at me and doesn't touch the possum, he gets a snack. He learned that in like two trips. <laughs> so but they clean up. They, they clean up a lot of the waste and a possum can eat more than a mouse. So my possum goes out at night, inhales what hits the ground. There's less for mice. So there's less mice hanging out to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Another option. <laughs> Are you just feeding your possum bird food? Bird seed off that's on the ground that would just gets wet okay. and gooey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She, he or he just lap, 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 just goes to town. Yeah. And uh, so I have a, I, I just, I'm fond of possums. I think they get a bad rap with that rat looking tail. Mm -hmm. but they're, if we didn't have them, they're such a big cleanup crew. You know, they really take care of a lot of um, animal death, you know, and again, you could, could definitely kill a possum by poisoning things too. So we have to be really careful of our of our food chain. If we are seeing more wildlife in our yards, does that mean that we are doing better at conservation? You know, it, definitely if you have uh, amphibians, any frogs or salamanders, those are keystone for healthy environments because they cannot handle excessive overloads. Um, if you over herbicide or over pesticide, it's not getting, it isn't going where it's supposed to go. Um, they definitely won't be there. Um, but if you slowly create a habitat, even if you mix, you know, I know I have a lot of, you have a lot of gardeners who listen, a true, not like me, like pretends to be a gardener. I have hostas, so it looks like I'm a gardener. <laughs> um, but if you start to mix your cultivars with natives and you start to build a habitat, um, you'll start to see things that you didn't know. You know, my big thing that I always tell my, in my garden workshops, I don't think anybody should be allowed to kill anything until they know everything about it. And then go mm -hmm. ahead. I mean, if you want to salt a slug, wait, first find out about it, right? And then maybe, you, maybe you'll be like, oh, it's not going to eat the whole plant, <laughs> you know? Or if you decide, it's your call. There's no endangered species slug that we have in Illinois, right? That anybody's going to care about. But I really think it's a matter of some empathy that you could build for those in your, in your space. Because if you build it, they will come. And most of the interactions we have with wildlife is because we're building it. Now, if you, like me, feed birds, you get squirrels. And you, they definitely do better than they would without help, but they have, they can exist without us. We think we have to feed the birds. No, we don't. We do it for us. We just like to think we're spending all that money to help them, but we're really spending a lot of money on entertainment. And quite frankly, I have two indoor cats that love to watch the bird feeders and it makes them very happy. Um, so yeah, we, we create, we can create a situation where we encounter the food chain, which is hard. You know, if you have a Cooper's hawk and you're feeding birds, you've just invited the dinner table, right? And that's that's part of that dinner table. Um, so we have to be, it's hard. I had a Cooper's hawk nab a junco out of my yard. And I was like, oh, like, oh wait, I teach this. I can do this. And it flew right at my picture window with the face of that junco right at the window. Like, oh. thanks. I'm like, no, no. And then it went over the top of the house. I'm like, okay. You teach this, it's the food chain, jungles aren't endangered, it's fine. What is the, it's all how life happened. And then the feathers from the Southern wind that was gone that day came lofting over the house out of the front spruce and it was just parts of jungle feathers floating everywhere. I'm like, okay, I'm done, I'm going, I'm out, I'm out. Gotta go do something else. <laughs> well, Peggy, you know, I was looking at uh, Cornell's feeder watch records. Uh, yeah. Sharp shin hawks, number 25 for last year. So, I mean, uh, Cooper's Hawks, you know, they're on the list every, every so often. So uh, yeah, you feed the birds every once in a while. You got to feed the, feed the other birds and, too. And I Cooper's suppose. Hawks used to be considered, uh, I think considered nearly or threatened years and years ago, been doing this long time. And I'm like, today they're just 
they're just as mm -hmm. common as and i think it's because we do you know we've we keep increasing the food available to feed that food chain yeah. so if you have to you can look at it that you saved an animals you know an endangered a nearly in, you know threatened or endangered species if that helps as they fly mm -hmm. by with with your junko in their mouth yeah yes. or worse a cardinal that would oh, really yeah. set people mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. so sticking with the kind of the habitat theme God, what's the state of habitat loss? We hear a lot about <clears throat> different animals being uh, losing their habitat, becoming endangered, um, what have you. Um, are we ever going to kind of turn that corner on habitat loss? And you've kind of mentioned some of this, but what can we do at home when so it comes to habitat? I think the key is not only being an, like I work with, you know, I have a neighbor and we share a garden and the key is slow education, right? It's for native species. Again, we're not, I never ask anybody to ditch you know, um, what we would call typical gardening with cultivars and, you know, going for just the color and stuff. I can see, and I totally see why you would do that visually. Um, but getting those natives in there, but then educating the next neighbor. So a, a yard is an oasis, but if you have, think about our voles, they live in a quarter acre. Think about how many other insects and animals live in a tiny space. I, I believe gardeners could save the world if they would mix and match and add their natives and get a contiguous habitat. Mm. If I could slowly get, I've got neighbors three doors down that have come to my programs and now they ask me questions. Well, we were going to plant this with our roses to, would that be a good native? Absolutely. Right. So that education of your neighbor and yourself to just slowly increase a contiguous habitat is what's going to save things. We have green space being saved, but the human population isn't going to slow down. Right. So yeah wherever we are, we own, I own this little, well, the bank does still, but right. But I have a half acre <laughs> and I want to get to a, and I'm not in a homeowner's association. So my goal is to have a no mo space, a mode space for the dogs and to entertain friends. Um, but I, I'm trying to do what I say should be done at a level, maybe higher than a normal, than a, than a, I don't know what a good word would be because I think gardeners are amazing. I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't have that much. I can't put in something and, and worry that much or I'll be a train wreck. Right? <laughs> Is that a Japanese beetle? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I do, you know, and so I, I just honor the gardener so much, but I also realized that think about the gardening last I knew was the number one global hobby. If that's the case and all those, even if they own a patio on a, in a condo and they have a pot, put something native in there that feeds something to keep our food chain alive. This is really about saving ourselves, right? If our food chain collapses. And one of the things that many of those of you in Hort uh, brought to my attention was the one third, you know, one third, every third bite is because of pollinators. And, and then a friend of mine in my own field said, well, then I'll just eat something different. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not the point. The point is if you're down to two thirds of your food chain, you're in the, in the middle of a food chain collapse. Mm -hmm. That's not about choosing to get, have to eat different food. That's about saving ourselves, right? Um, save the planet was the dumbest slogan, but we thought yeah. it was good, right? Because it separated us from the planet. I, I say that way too much, but um, so it's really about how do we continue to educate ourselves and our friends and just put in something every year, one plant that, that serves others other than ourselves. And then figure out a way if bird feeding makes you crazy because the squirrels, then maybe stop feeding the birds or go, I'm just going to enjoy them. I, I try to keep the squirrels on my property. Um, cause my neighbor doesn't like them. <laughs> I have an owl box that the, they get to sleep in. I've got all these other wooden boxes ready to go up. So they sleep on my property and stay. And then they go over there cause they feed the birds, you know, and the possums go over there. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to, salvage what we own and then volunteer help places that are bigger if we don't have a lot of property and we don't want to do natives for for you know because we like how we garden go help a space like a conservation space volunteer to help make those places healthier and bigger yeah i i'm doing the sustainable landscaping talk for a program coming up in a few months and i was like ah sustainable i never liked that term very much because it's like sustainable landscaping. Well, the landscape, it can take care of itself, really. What we're talking about is sustaining the human population. You know, yeah. we're, that's what we really mean by that. Right. Yeah. Think about how happy all the wildlife was or so freaked out when we went silent at the end of March. Mm -hmm. When the cars stopped moving 
and the bustle stopped. I bet the animals were like, huh. Was there, a, was there a chorus going out and they're like, oh. Well, and all, and all the coyotes that were born in March and all the other wildlife young were born into an almost silent world in comparison. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we lit back up. Yeah. I, I see so many more dead animals on the way to work this year. So many animals, smaller ones. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, they were born when there was hardly a car. And now there's like traffic, you know, yeah. so and lots of variety of animals, birds too. A lot of birds of prey, which cause the mice are just having a good old time. <laughs> well, speaking about crossing the road in the news, they've been talking about this wildlife bridge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they have, they have cameras and things where you can watch what's happening on the wildlife bridge that crosses over what I think it was like eight, nine lanes of traffic or. Yeah, it was like six or eight. Yeah, six Utah, or eight. The one in Utah. Yes, yes. Um, so. Do, does is it working to do would a wildlife bridge work to help minimize one death to wildlife and two like possible injury or death to a, like a human mm -hmm. uh, in the car yeah i read up on that one in utah and they really thought it was going to take a long time for the animals to get comfortable to use it uh when they put a uh at nechusa grasslands up here in northern illinois they put a big culvert tube under a road so they could expand the herd's range and it took a while before mm -hmm. one of them but once one went through they all just okay cool they all now they use it like no they don't they don't mind it at all but i what i read was that they really thought it was going to take a while for those animals to utilize that crossover and we have to remember they built it there for a reason so somebody was taking note of the quantity of car insurance bills mm -hmm. and, you know, animals that they were picking up off the road um, and probably chose that space. doesn't mean that they're going to come from two miles down the road to use it, but they, you know, natural selection over time, they're going to train whoever's using that, all those different species. For those who haven't seen it, there were, I think there were moose, bobcat, ground squirrels, there was coyotes, um, it's just a huge variety of the food chain um, using the this crossing, this overpass that they, I would say, decorated to look natural. Uh, and because they did it so well, they started using it almost immediately. So with natural selection, all the young of those animals that are utilizing it will be trained that that is a typical path style to use. So you could then do more of those. And as that changes, they would naturally choose that over the crossing the road. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be interested to see the research later to see how far, you know, north, south, east, west, whichever that bridge goes, there's roadkill. Yeah. How far do they come to utilize that now? And then later with natural selection, you know, how far do they come to find a place that's now we know this is how we cross. That's I fascinating. Think, I think it's cool. I'd love to see more of them employed to see, yeah, if how effective they could be. So I, I, I don't know how they would do it in the flat plains of Illinois, but we don't have much topography to work with. <laughs> but it would, it would definitely stand out. It yes. Stand out. Yes. You could cross on the mountain here. We're yeah. getting ready. I just got word today up here. We have a 60, 60 year old bridge that crosses our Kishwaukee river at where I work at my natural resource center. And they're getting ready to put a full span bridge across from road height instead of the one we have, which is a ramp way down and then stairs. Mm. This thing's gonna go arcing across. It's not gonna touch any of the muscles in the water. I'm interested because it's you. what I know of, I know the raccoons use the bridge because like Katie's cat friend, they like to let me know they've what they've eaten. <laughs> they're gonna leave it there for me. I'm interested and I'm hoping we get, you know, we've set up a camera right away. We have to be careful because people use the bridge, but I wanna know, if there's going to be a difference in just walking off level across a bridge or taking the ramp and the stairs, if there's a difference in my raccoon use or mm -hmm. an increase, um, I'm really interested in, in, we have deer that cross the water. They never, that I know of, they don't go up this huge flight of stairs, cross and go up the ramp. They just go through the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. This, they might just walk over this thing. I don't know. And that would be interesting to see if they make that change. Well, Peggy, but, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, as I was gonna say, but money, right? Cost. Mm -hmm. All about cost. money. Mm -hmm. How do you, I can, millions to put in one of those over an interstate highway. Yeah. Millions. So. Yeah, millions. So you, you got to be able to offset that with the insurance money, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, uh, the savings. Yeah. You know, I'm sure they could tell you 
the in not, not too long a time by counting how many large animals i mean if you hit a moose you're gonna know you hit a moose mm -hmm. and your car is gonna show it yeah um i think there'll be some they'll be able to support what they did with cost recovery you know looking at cost savings of of injury medical bills car repair you know those kinds of things well peggy we are also a question and answer show and being wildlife in the garden, we have quite a few questions today, really from all over the state. Um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, helping us answer these questions. Sure. Excellent. All right, well, Katie, why don't you go ahead and kick us off with our first one. Awesome. Uh, so Peggy, we receive a lot of questions about feeding wildlife in urban areas, but one that we specifically got from a Cook County resident that has been feeding their neighborhood squirrels. They're asking, uh, they've been feeding the neighborhood Eastern gray and fox squirrels for about three months. Does this disrupt their natural behavior when humans provide them with food? Also another question that causes uh, this provider, this resident to lose some sleep is they've recently noticed a hawk and a coyote in the field next to their house. Is this creating an unnatural environment, having so many squirrels in one area at the same time? And then they're also worried about the potential of the squirrels being taken. Mm. Yeah, we set ourselves up for heartache when we start feeding animals because they're still going to go through natural processes and they, they don't know where the food comes from. I mean, they see a person, but really they don't understand that concept. So I think, you know, feeding the squirrels is going to increase it's going to increase their success of getting through winter. They can live without us. They know how and natural selection will work there too, right? They are going to possibly stay out longer because they're going to build up more fat on food we give them and they're not going to have to burn calories to find it. So when, when squirrels bury things in the yard, they don't remember uh, unlike that post-it note commercial years ago where they'd run up and put a post-it note in the tree, one, you know, behind the garage. And um, they use their sense of smell. They can smell, if they bury something in the ground, it's, it's just not very deep, right? It's just deep enough to sprout. Um, so they bury it in the ground. They can smell through a foot of snow into the ground and find those. So they're really all planting for each other. I mean, that's how the forests of, you know, we get forests, right? Forgotten acorns and, and beech nuts and hickory nuts. Uh, so feeding the squirrels is fine. You are going to increase your chances of witnessing the food chain in action. I will say a lot of the hawks that we're having, especially in Cook County, are going to be your suburban sharpshin, Cooper's hawks, a red tail possibly, but the, the Cooper's hawks are even of the two is larger and they don't even regularly try to take a squirrel because a squirrel could hurt them. Right. I see the squirrels all the time messing with my, I have a Cooper's hawk and he lands on the back fence to look for mice in the field and the squirrels go and bug him. Like clearly they know they're too big for him. So coyotes are after mice that eat bird seed. Coyotes are diurnal. They come out during the day. They're not sick or injured, but they don't like to be seen. So they're going to sneak out at, you know, dusk and dawn. They're going to check out the feeder. Your squirrels are sleeping. Squirrels are strictly diurnal. They do not come out at night. So if you have coyotes there, now if you get a hungry coyote, a weakened coyote, you know, that'd be great if he could get a hold of a squirrel. But really they're hunting for those mice. The, the, they like to swallow their food, bite, swallow, move on. Squirrels are a little big, right, for that. They will take them. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I can, one of the things I can think of that could be a problem, squirrels are chewers. They chew on wood around your door frames. They chew on my nature center wood, like siding. So you could create a situation where they start chewing on something like that. The other problem is if you get one of them and they have mange, you're bringing all these mammals together. And so now you could give, they could all get mange. And now you're going to have a bunch of naked squirrels. Mange is a parasite and they scratch until they're bald. So now you have half dressed squirrels. Luckily they're fat from eating, you know, nuts and seeds, but that is one way we could cause them harm. But you know, they're not an endangered species, neither the gray nor the fox squirrel. I will tell you that the fox is my favorite. Uh, the gray squirrels are mean. They pick on the fox squirrels. Um, they're the devil's spawn, those little gray squirrels. 
Um, they will fight and contend. I like the squirrels at the feeders because it's the only exercise my dogs get in the winter. I wait till I see the squirrels. I say squirrel and they run and then they sleep the rest of the day. Um, so it is a, a way for them. Um, they've only caught one once and it got away and did this wild matrix thing through the air and grabbed the fence and, and left. Um, so I kind of rattle the doorknob and now they know, the squirrels know the rattling doorknob means the dogs are coming. So isn't that horrible? That's probably not nice, <laughs> but it keeps the squirrels healthy. It burns a little bit of that excess fat, keeps their muscles strong. In a normal situation, like out at the woods where I work, the squirrels in the worst of weather in the winter do go into kind of a, a dormancy. They will just hunker into their nest. Their nests are warm. They have like, what was it I read the other day? friend of mine wrote an article, 26 layers of leaves was in one of them. They can actually keep their ambient temperature in the sixties if their body's in there with it. So they go just sleep it off and they, they hold that, that they use their fat while they're doing that. Your squirrels may not have to do that if they're fed that well. So those are all the things I can think of at the moment. So speaking of dormancy, we've got a question from Morgan County. Uh, do raccoons hibernate? Um, they haven't been seeing their usual or hearing their usual group recently. I wish they would hibernate. <laughs> I get so many calls about raccoons. They aren't hibernators. They're out foraging. Um, they will eat many things they wouldn't have to eat in warmer weather. Um, you don't want one to figure out that garbage is good. Keep your garbage cans sealed. They, they come to feeders um, and eat bird seed. Uh, bird seed, you know, black oil sunflower is an amazing high caloric food for everybody. They're going to come out at night. So if you want to look at, you know, you're feeding squirrels daytime, you may, if you have squirrels, you may very well be feeding raccoons all night long and not know it. Um, but they aren't, they, they'll, they'll hunker into a, a, a log or a, an open tree. They don't build a nest. They have to have a cavity of some kind or a hole, you know, not, not a den, but like if there's a, a spot where they could get under a log, cause it's shaped that way, they need cover. Uh, they don't, um, they don't just, I'm sure some of them have to just sleep in a ball in a crook of a tree too, just for lack of, lack of enough space. But again, raccoons are urban, you know, they have figured it out. They'll eat a mouse. They'll eat just about anything they can get their hands on in the winter. So if you do put food out for any other animal and you can bring it in, if you have chickens or ducks or anything, um, they love the, the seed, the feed is the easiest, all that corn. Um, but they will eat other animals in order to survive. They don't know you love your chickens, right? They don't know you want them not to be taken or harmed. Um, these animals are out to survive. Our next question comes from Lee County. And so this person has found that Irish spring in dog fur is not keeping the deer away from their yard. How do they stop deer from rubbing tree trunks and stripping the branches on trees and shrubs in their yard? Oh, it's a the deer question again. <laughs> um, I hadn't heard the Irish Spring one though. Um, I've heard bars of soap, but I, I didn't think about that. Um, you know, <laughs> it's nearly impossible. Our deer population in Illinois is really high. So when you have a, a an animal that large with no natural predators, you know, uh, hunting is a, is a, is a way um, car collisions, sadly, because people can get hurt is another way and diseases. Um, we just, they don't have natural, they're doubling their population every two years. Right. So, you know, you, it's ridiculous. You, you can't fence your whole world, right. You can't fence every shrub at the height you would need to. Um, you can use lights that pop on with movement. You can use, um, I know some places that have gardens where you pay and get tickets to, they will use movement censored sprinkler systems. Um, so it's kind of a multitude of things to startle them. But depending on where you live, what are your neighbors going to think when lights come on, there's this god awful noise and water starts shooting all over the place. Um, they may not be too happy with that. And in the summer, if anybody has their windows open and you're like, wee, wee, psh, 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 you know, um, but then there's also the thing of where they're going to go. They're going to go to the next person's house. You know, I always say that about Canada geese. Don't mow your grass for a while until you get a, you know, the citation that says, if you don't mow your grass, if you're on a homeowners, don't mow your grass. They don't like tall grass, but don't tell your neighbors because they got to go somewhere. Right. It's, it's the secret life of animals. Um, and I don't mean that obviously, but 
Uh, you know, you cannot, you cannot legally take animals where there's homes unless you're on your own farm and you have all the, per, you know, the permit, the habitat tag and the deer permit, you could eliminate them during season or invite friends to also hunt your property if you ha are in such a position. But in town, that, it comes down to a wildlife management plan that everybody can agree with socially for a community. And the community has to have a say in all that and how that's going to work. Um, and the rubbing, the rubbing is during rut. If you have something strip and bark by rubbing, you've got a, a, a male, you know, rubbing trees. Females don't rub the trees, um, but they, they will nibble the bark, especially this time of year when, when things start getting colder and there's less things to eat. Usually they'll leave it alone until um, it gets snow covered. But if you have something that tastes that good, it's probably going to happen every year until you find one of those, what they call deer resistant, um, you know, plants to put in the ground in place of that one. It's not much help. I'm sorry. All right. Our next question is from McDonough County. Um, they like birds, but not mice. I think that would be most people. Um, how can I feed the birds without also setting up shop for the rodents? I don't know if you can, unless you do what Chris was talking about, and then all year round, reduce your population. So reducing your mouse population, increasing your habitat, like what you were talking about earlier, Ken. So you increase your habitat, you get a, you get a more full animal food chain going. You have a couple Cooper's hawks. They aren't going to bother sharpshins. They're not going to bother your squirrels, but they need to eat. So they're going to go after mice, but they're also going after the birds because they're sitting in the wide open um, and they're daytime hunters. So you need to increase your owl population, all of which have territories um, you know, if you have a great horned owl, um, they're calling right now because they're courting um, and they're courting and come February when they're on nest, you know, they're going to defend that territory. Like, so you're going to only have a pair of great horned owls to consume all those animals. Um, but the more, <clears throat> the more habitat you can create with the more diversity, the less you'll have to deal with those things. But if you don't have a full Play, if you don't have the snakes and the coyotes and the foxes to take down the rodent population, then you're going to have to deal with the rodent population. Um, there's just no way around that because you're offering a meal. You know, think about the size of, the, of a seed to a mouse's stomach and the energy that that would give them. Um, it's pretty crazy. So it might be more looking at everything from a different lens you know, a different perspective and decide how badly do I want to feed the birds? You know, pros and cons. I really love the birds. I guess it'll just have to be the mice, right? And then allow the possum to come in and eat a ton of that spare seed. Because unlike a raccoon, they don't, you know, maybe they're not going to tear things up or have diseases um, as often. And then there's nothing for the mice to eat. But now you have to be okay with a possum coming in and looking out the window and seeing a possum at night just mowing down seed that's on the ground. They rarely climb the feeder. I've never seen a possum up in my feeders because the birds make such a mess. And that's the same food that the mouse would eat, one seed at a time, but the, the possum is literally shoveling. And actually raccoons will do that too, but they'll climb up into the feeder and take the non-scrap seed as well. We received a question from Facebook about raccoons using their backyard as a latrine. Mm -hmm. What can they do to stop this behavior? Well, tell your neighbors what you're going to do first and grab an old radio and turn it on talk radio and put a tub over it because then it's even, you know, whoa, 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 you know, scarier. It sounds like the peanuts teacher gone mad. Uh, but, you know, throw a cord on it, get it out to where that area, they often like decks um, mowed grass, short, they don't like to be tickled when they go to the bathroom, right? They don't like, they love logs. So you can, you can eliminate some things, but if you love your decorative boulder and they're pooping on that, you know, make sure that they can hear that radio, um, and leave it on, <clears throat> leave it on for a couple weeks, turn it off for a while, see if they'll pick a new spot really close by. They'll only go so far, but we had this same question, um, before, and I had, uh, out at a, at a parsonage at a church, it was standing on the deck and then putting waste on the threshold of a sliding door a few inches higher, like literally all but sitting on it. And so we did that and for one week and they went away and then it came back and used the deck that it was standing on before. So we put, turned it on for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And now 12 feet away is what their next spot was a window well. <laughs> 
And then we did it for one more week. And then they went out to a pine tree that had a pine, a bunch of logs that somebody had cut and never burned. And they let it be. And they've never come back to that house spot. We don't care if they go out there in the farthest corner of the yard, but it took, you know, a series of, nope, we're going to give you the voice. And then they move a little farther. I thought they were gone. And then I was out there doing some work and I looked in the window. Well, I'm like, Oh, that's nasty. <laughs> so it's that talk radio seems to be, it doesn't seem to work for any other animal. Um, but those little miniature bears, those raccoons. <laughs> trash pandas yes <laughs> all right uh next question is also from mcdonough county uh so this person has five cats uh three of which live outside um but mice still get in their, their house uh, we catch and release the mice in the woods behind their house um, are these the same mice coming back time after time i wish i knew that answer i uh i think the same thing if you know i'm I am not against um, mouse traps. That's sometimes, you know, we have to remember rodents can carry things that we don't want historically. Um, they've been the demise of populations of people, right? Mice and rats. But uh, we have, uh, we had a mouse in the house, my house early, cause they, I live right by a cornfield. The minute they harvest, it's all hands on deck. And I have one great mouser and then this new kitten. And wouldn't you know, she, she takes care of them. Um, but she brought one upstairs. They come in in the basement. She brought one upstairs and took the kitten into the guest bedroom and dropped it, made sure she saw it and walked away and looked at me. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It was like training day. So I had to go through the effort of catching this thing because I, you know, it's one thing she was playing with it, but not figuring out what she could do. So we, I finally, I have, I have contraptions. I have, I keep them. My son and I each have a clear container at the bottom of a berry box and a broken piece of quarter round. And we go, <laughs> and you want to be able to see where it's at in the box and then slide something under it. And I take it out to my side prairie and I go, this is, this is your opportunity, bud, move on. But they very well, right. Could be moving in, but the population of mice is so high, you know, when, you know, they breed at such a high level. Um, you can take them as far as you want, but I'm thinking driving them somewhere would be the only way you'd be sure they wouldn't be heading right back in, you know, I don't know. But uh, the outdoor cats clearly aren't doing their job. <laughs> if they're getting past the first threshold, you know, um, and or the mice are just that good or the quantity is so high that they're getting what they want, you know, and they don't need any more. Um, my dad used to say, reduce the food you feed them and they'll start eating more. I'm like, you know, that's not fair. So um, there was a time I had outdoor cats and in my field, people don't appreciate outdoor cats because of the bird population loss. And my dad was an agronomist, uh, World War II vet. And I said, dad, I feel horrible. You know, I've got this, these two outdoor cats, but they were barn cat. They weren't going to be indoor cats. And I said, I feel so bad. And I said, cause you know, the bird feeder, he goes, if those birds can get caught in the wide open by a domestic cat, they shouldn't be part of the breeding pool. That is not how natural selection works. I'm like, oh, I felt so much better. <laughs> but on my my cats are indoor now. I don't I don't let them go out and nab them because the hawks are doing that enough. So our last question comes from Facebook, and they're asking: Often hunters will pass on a doe to bag a big buck. It seems wrong to take out the strongest animal. Usually nature picks off the sick, old, and weak. What's the best practice for population control of deer? So there were, you know, you think about those values. So the person that sent that um, clearly loves the aesthetics, as I do, of white-tailed deer. They're a magnificent animal. You know, when you think about how they're built and how they're built to survive and every hair on their body is hollow. So they're walking around with this dead air insulation jacket. I want that. You know, you see snow on them. Um, they, they aren't suffering. The hunter is looking for a trophy and that can work against some of those values in our hearts. But what I would say is as hard as that is for us to see, natural selection will still happen. Um, we have two diseases. We talked about this maybe last time. Um, we have two diseases in Illinois right now that are going after that deer population. And that happens only when the deer population is too high. Mother nature steps in and calls the herd. And that still will happen. Even if somebody chooses a buck over a doe, 
the thing is, if it makes people feel better, the buck's not going to taste as good. It's going to be tough. <laughs> it's going to be not the best eating piece of material, right? Because he's a tough. But we have to remember that every buck can service a multitude of females. Every female has one fawn the first year. And every year after that has twins or occasionally triplets. By taking out one buck, you could actually help the, the population to ward off future diseases by reducing the number. That's hard for our hearts. But when, when I see someone with a buck and they're excited, go for it. Chew on that all day if you can eat it. But his turn, his turn happened and there's others coming up the ranks very fast and um, he gave good, good genes to those for surviving the diseases, but one buck could save us a lot of, of issues in our deer population for the deer's sake alone. Um, but it's hard on us because our values, you know, it's tricky. That utilitarian um, that needs to hunt for food is going to pick a doe because they can eat it, you know, and, and, and e more easily consume the meat. Um, so we just have to be careful because all values are always at the table and we have to honor everybody's choices. And, as, and I always turn to legality. If it's legal, it's been thought through um, for a reason that there's a tag you can take a buck over a doe. Um, and we have to honor that because there's research behind that. Um, and, our, and our deer population is exquisitely, you know, when people say, oh, the deer population is dropping, it's usually from like 150% to 120%. And that's not healthy for the deer. It's just not. Um, so something that's a different perspective, another lens. And yes, it is hard. I used to work, I, I worked a deer check station and I had a 21 point buck come in. Atypical. He did not want me to age it. And that requires, you know, taking, uh, harming the face a bit. And what made me so um, impressed was he honored that animal at such a high regard for everything. He couldn't quit touching it. And yeah, it was dead, but he had a, a reverence for it that it was, it was, it was like, it was the 19, you know, forties and he would, you know, he had accomplished something. Um, but he honored the fact that though he was the winner, there was a loss involved. And I really appreciated that, that, in that man that day, he had to get a trailer it was like the size of an elk, a small elk. This thing was massive. It was Union County, Southern Illinois. They grow them big down there. <laughs> yeah, those Southern Illinois deer, they're, they're big deer. I, I, I've been down there at Carbondale campus and sometimes they're a little ornery mm. there as well. <laughs> yeah. Comfort, comfort. That's right. Well, Peggy Doty, that was some wonderful information. I love listening to you. Um, I just want, I know you don't call yourself a gardener, um, but I just want to go outside right now. And I just want to go sit on the cold ground and be immersed outside in the garden in nature. So thank you so much for Absolutely. being on the show today. I love being here. I enjoy it. Well, we love having you. The Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. Of course, we could not do this without our co-hosts here, Kitty Parker, Ken Johnson. Thank you both so much for being here this week. Absolutely. Thank you, Peggy, for joining us. No and it's always good to see you, nice Chris and Ken. Yes, thank you, Peggy. I learned a lot again. Yeah. And uh, Chris and Katie, thank you. Let's do it again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. We're going to be talking with Sarah Hewson all about insects. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, kind of the things that we might be finding in our homes this time of year, like pantry moths, cereal moths. That should be a fun show. Ken will be. is really, <laughs> he is, I mean, he is so excited right now. I mean, this is, this is his Christmas present, folks. So, uh, <laughs> well, folks, we want to thank you so much for doing what you do best. And that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.